Yes. I'm live. Uh, hi, my name is Peter Heiberg, uh, and I'm uh, trying to tell my story how I got started with machine learning. Um, and uh, I, I always was uh, interested in uh, trying to apply new technologies. I got interested in, in the area of machine learning. Uh, but then it all looked like this uh, blackboard here. It was just a lot of maths and formulas. And uh, ever since I started uh, studying at the university, math became my nemesis. Before that, uh, I was pretty good at math, but then I started uh, studying engineering, and everything was math, and I just hated it. So I got scared when I uh, looked into machine learning, and I uh, pushed it uh, back and uh, didn't uh, pursue that. But then... Um, in my daily work, I don't. Uh, I work with uh, as a consultant, and I work with uh, engineering, and uh, and don't come near machine learning in my day-to-day -day job. But uh, I uh, do a bit of spare time programming, and I uh, stumble over a project that I find interesting, and that got me started with machine learning. So. In order to tell you uh, about that product, I, I'll take a step back and tell you about uh, personal branding before social media. If you want to know something about me today, you maybe go to LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever and find some information about me. But this stuff isn't new, I just discovered. In the past, there were uh, publishing houses, uh, publishing books about different types of uh, professions. So there could be a book about priests down here in the south of Sweden. There could be books about bakers, books about uh, anybody living in a small city, for example. And it worked uh, that way, that uh, publishing houses had agents coming to people, uh, asking them, uh, do you want to be part of our book? If you uh, buy a copy, you submit a photo of yourself and a biography, and we, you can be part of uh, our book. So uh, a person, for example, my uh, grandfather's uncle, uh, Edwin, he was a uh, woodworking teacher, and uh, he, f he got the best picture of himself, uh, wrote a long text stating everything he accomplished during his life, who his parents were, where he was born, and his political work uh, in Stockholm, and so on. Uh, so it's a rich material that's available because there are lots of books. Uh, along came a crazy guy with a scanner, and uh, he started buying up uh, lots of these books uh, and scanning them and publishing them on Dropbox for people to find, uh, to do research, for example, genealogy or local history work and so on. Uh, and I'm into genealogy, so I did discovered this project. Uh, and a bunch of other programmers as well, and we have Jöran, Jonas, and Stefan, uh, came along and saw that Dropbox is, isn't ideal. It's kind of hard to find by just looking for n uh, names based on the file names. <coughs> so they created a editable wiki, which had the uh, image here and uh, where people could go in here and read the text and then index the information in the image. And when I uh, looked at this, pro this project, I found that this is quite tedious work to do this manually. There must be a better way. Uh, and I uh, started looking into machine learning, uh, first of all to uh, do the OCR, to uh, optical character recognition, to get this uh, searchable. Uh, and then I, I figured when I made the text searchable, maybe I could translate that to this uh, information here because all the texts here are quite structured, or semi-structured uh, at least. And uh, so all this text here could be translated into this somehow. And that's when I started looking into natural language processing. Uh, and I found that there are quite a lot of products already available that can be used without 
knowing all the maths behind it. Someone else has already done uh, all the heavy thinking and created models that are ready uh, to use. So if we look at this text, it's pretty structured. I, as a human, can uh, pick out the parts that are uh, interesting. So I can see that we have a surname, we have uh, first names, we have a birthplace, and so on. Uh, and in Azure, there is a ready-made service or a pris. It's the language understanding services, Lewis. And uh, it's presented as being a way to uh, interact with uh, a home automation system, for example, or some kind of travel booking system. Uh, so the examples have that I have a sentence here, and the sentence has an intent. In this case, it's booking a flight, for example. But it could also be to give a command to a home automation system. And then it consists of a set of entities. Uh, it has a source and a destination and a quantity of tickets, for example. And this could all be transferred to my uh, scenario uh, after I process the information I have. So we have a printed text. We first need to convert it into electronic text. And then we have, for example, the Azure Vision API OCR, or there is Tesseract uh, open source framework you can run locally, for example. Uh, then we need to take that electronic text and normalize it. We need to transfer it into all lowercase, remove all characters not necessarily uh, producing any information, such as uh, periods, commas, and so on. Uh, and then we need to interpret that into these intents and entities. And while uh, once we have those uh, that uh, uh, automatically extracted data, we can uh, apply custom code to produce some kind of facts. So custom code could be to, we have a text describing a place, we could look that up in Google Maps or wherever and translate that to actual coordinates, for example. Uh, in Lewis, which I started using, uh, you can tag, so we, we have the entire text, we can tag the interesting parts and uh, name those uh, entities that I see are interesting for my use case. So we have the last name, the first names, the birthplace, and we can also define uh, composite entities such as the date, uh, w which is uh, a birth date in this case, where we have date, month, and year. We also see that we have some dates that could uh, lack. We don't. We know the marriage was in 1914, but we don't know the month and the day. So it's still a composite year uh, only date, for example. Uh, you get an uh, from Lewis. You get an API where you input the text and your API key. So this is the query, and the response that comes back is this. Uh, so if we go back and actually look at the text, it doesn't say what uh, Helen's uh, profession was in the text. But uh, y if you remember that you could define an intent, uh, the intent could be book a ticket, for example. In my case, the intent is more about the structure of the text. This structure is typical for someone working as a pharmacist when someone uh, from a book about police officers would have a different structure, and that would correspond to the intent. So we get a uh, intent that's detected, which in my case I abused to be the kind of book or the kind of structure of the text. So in this case, it actually detects, well, this is a book about, or a text about the pharmacist, which isn't in the text. We also get the set of entities uh, all with a different score, with uh, one being the highest, that this is in 86% uh, likelihood, this is uh, first names, for example. So in the end result, uh, I was able to uh, add to the uh, wiki, I was able to add the functionality to take our image here, uh, apply the OCR, and then from the OCR 
uh, we would get these different facts that the users, instead of typing in themselves, could either confirm with a checkbox here or uh, reject. And also, the intent would translate to a profession in this case, without it even being mentioned in the image. So without applying any math in this case, uh, I could actually add a very useful feature to the website where uh, entering this would normally take a couple of minutes, uh, but now it would just, well, accept everything that's in there or react something. So uh, that was the first part that I could actually just uh, plug and play into this. And then I got excited. Uh, we have all these images with faces. What if we could do something with that as well? Uh, and the database currently uh, consists of 800,000 images, so quite a lot of uh, faces. And we started looking into uh, how could we apply some uh, logic to these faces. <coughs> uh, <coughs> we had one problem because uh, this is a uh, non-profit project, so we have essentially no budget. All our budget uh, was going to actually uh, just uh, having this running in Azure on a virtual machine. That was all the money we had. Uh, so we, we looked into the Azure services uh, and well, this, there is a face detection service, there is a face recognition, uh, face API, we can recognize or validate faces, but it was way too costly for us because we had, uh, we were going for a, a million uh, images, it was costing per transaction. So uh, we ended up with a, another solution instead uh, where we could use a ready-made uh, library for Python called Face Recognition, which under its uh, under hood uses the Dlib library, which already has a uh, pre-trained model for recognizing faces that was available in the open. Uh, both these techniques, both uh, face recognition and also natural language processing, uh, is using convolutional neural network, uh, which is a uh, variant of uh, machine learning that is uh, is mimicking how the animal's uh, uh, visual cortex is working. So it's essentially it takes uh, input set and works as a function with a hidden uh, with hidden layers of feature maps that detects different parts of these images and uh, outputs that as a an array in the end of uh, floats. And in order to uh, compare if one image is, uh, or one face is uh, comparable to another face, you just take the distance between uh, these featured descriptors or an array of, of floats. Uh, the process for all the faces or all the images is uh, very much like the process for natural language processing. We take the image, uh, we need to detect all the faces that is in the image. Uh, and for this, uh, we only needed to do that once per image. We don't need to retrain everything uh, every time. So we decided to use the Azure Cognitive Services. There is a face API that can detect and also, for example, see if uh, as we saw on the image before, uh, is this is a woman, is it a man, is the person happy or not, and so on. <coughs> uh, and then we get the face locations available in the image. And then we applied custom code running on the server with the face recognition Python library and the Dlib, a sound learning knob model. Uh, uh, the face recognition and Dlib automatically uh, uses uh, a way to twist and turn the image in many different directions in order to uh, get a mean uh, face encoding. So if we have two images uh, that are taken from diff slightly different angles, for example, they would have different encodings, and then you take the mean values of all these in order to detect uh, another image that's in a third angle, for example. 
So in the output, we get uh, phase encoding, uh, and then we need to do this at scale. We had uh, 800,000 images. Uh, the face recognition library uh, works in memories, and we can compare one image to one other image, but there is no real way to scale that up without loading everything into the memory and doing it in memory. So what I discovered was uh, that the mechanism here is uh, just to uh, produce the distance between all the different encodings. And there is a module in the Postgres database that we use uh, called the cube module that can actually uh, calculate the distance on a scale, so between all the different 800,000 images instead. So uh, the Azure Cognitive Services has the face API for detecting the uh, face, so we can input uh, one of these uh, images that we have from the portrait biographies, get the output here with an ID so if we decided to use the Azure Face API for actually recognizing the faces, what we would do would be to call another service with this ID and say, well, this ID is corresponding to person one, for example. And then you can uh, input a number of images for the known person one, and then you can do another API call to uh, see which uh, of the persons is this most uh, looking like, for example. We also get a description of the different attributes that the face AI API can detect in the image. It's saying that this is a male. It has an age of 43 years old, which is surprisingly con correct for this image, which is taken in the 50s and it's born in 1910. Uh, and uh, an approximation of the different expressions that could be detected in this image as well. And as I said, the face recognition Python library that we uh, invoke uh, in, in the back end on the server uh, uses Python. Uh, you can use that to load an uh, image of a known face, for example. You apply the face encodings to that image, and you get an array uh, back out describing this image that consists of 128 different numbers. And to search for that, we uh, have another image that we don't know who is in this image. We load that as well, and we call the face distance method. Uh, and we get a distance for this uh, saying, well, if, if the distance is uh, small, then it's the same uh, image, or likely the same. If it's large, it's not. And you can do this. Uh, we do this on our images for each image that we have in the database. We call the face recognition face encoding to get some kind of, uh, of encoding on this. We can also describe how many times we should twist and turn the image to uh, appreciate different angles and so on. And we transform that to some kind of output that we can put in the database. So we have the image, we have the data uh, in the image, and with the image, we also have uh, an identification, hopefully, that someone has uh, indexed the image already and said that this is this person born in this year and so on. And we get the location in the image where this face is. There could potentially be many faces in the same Im image. And uh, what this face distance method actually does is to uh, compute the Euclidean distance which is uh, a formula that uh, sums all the differences between each and every element. Uh, and uh, it's basically like the Pythagorean theorem, but in the memory uh, dimensions. And luckily, in the Postgres database, uh, there is already functionality for using the Euclidean distance. Uh, so with this operator, you can do, uh, do the distance search. So for all the different faces in our image that we want to search for, we can add in uh, the encoding. And we have a table in the database containing all the different faces there. And we check if uh, the distance between the search vector and the, the actual faces we have uh, exceed a certain threshold. And uh, sort them by the best. So. 
we thought this could be a fun exercise. Just upload an image of ourselves and see if what face looks like mine. Uh, so we started trying it out. But then I, I figured, what if I tried that with real images? So I went to some Facebook groups uh, that have genealogists trying to figure out who is pictured in their photo album, for example. So Sandra here, she posted a question in the group and telling, I found this in my grandfather's uh, album, but I don't know who it is. Can someone tell me what kind of marking he has uh, on his clothes? maybe when it's taken. So I tried uploading it into the database. Um, and I waited, and I thought this might be fun. And it turned out he used that image in his portrait biography. And it was a perfect match. Oh, I was lucky, as I was thinking it was the same image. Um, but I could go back to her and say, well, this is Jan Theophil Söderström. This is amazing. How did you know that it was Jan Theophil? Uh, I don't know he, how he knew my my grandfather, and it turned out he was a teacher that taught on her uh, on the school that her grandfather went. And I told her about the project I was uh, working with. So I tried this a couple of more occasions in the same uh, group. Uh, she had uh, this image, and now it found an image that's not quite the same image, but it's clearly the same person, I can see that. Uh, so I posted and she was suppressed again and asking how I found it. Uh, and it also turned out that her mother knew this man. Uh, and it later was confirmed by his son that yes, this is an image of him. So I, I was hooked and I thought, how could I apply this uh, in other settings? And I found that there is a Swedish website, digitalmuseum.se, where different museums publish their photos. Uh, and the Army Museum uh, has quite a lot of uh, photos where it says unknown uh, officer at the Kronprinsens Hussar Regiment here in Malmö, for example. So I started going through them, created a script, downloading all images that had unknown officer in some kind of way. And uh, I uploaded them, compared them uh, to the archive. And it turned out I uh, earlier I uh, actually batch imported 20,000 uh, images of known officers from uh, Riksarkivet in Sweden. So I had quite a, uh, quite a good uh, hit rate. This is the same man, but in a different photo, for example. And I started commenting on uh, Amir Museum's uh, homepage, s s telling them who uh, each officer was. And they say, oh, this is amazing. How do you do this? We have uh, 10 people trying to identify the uniforms, pinpoint the years, going through books, and it takes us forever to do this. Um, so I told them about the project and said, you can use it yourself. Uh, we're uh, um, a non-profit. Uh, if you make a donation, we'll uh, appreciate it. Uh, so they uh, signed up and started doing the identification themselves as well. So uh, in the beginning, I found that machine learning was really uh, a scary topic with all the math and so on. Uh, but it turned out there was uh, quite a few intelligent people uh, that actually knew how to create the models and I could apply them without actually knowing how to do everything. I needed to find out how to invoke those APIs and find uh, the code to do it. But someone like Goran could develop a synthetic data or uh, all the models. And then uh, in if uh, I decide to uh, delve further into this, you could do your own custom models. These models that I've used now are not optimized for uh, for many of the old uh, photographies that are small and gray scale and so on. So you could use uh, a custom model, and but in my case, it turned out it's it's good enough to identify a couple of hundred officers and so on. Um, well, that was my journey getting started uh, in machine learning. And uh, here are links to the different resources I've talked about and I used. Um.
Thank you. Any questions? Better now. <coughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing. Uh, how many people are now in your database? Uh, there are about 800,000 uh, unique photographies in the database. Some of them contain multiple uh, faces, but uh, most around 800,000, I would say. And uh, the oldest, the earliest? Uh, the earliest from photo. From what century? Uh, photography was invented in the mid uh, 1800s, so I, I'd guess uh, around the earliest was probably born around the late 1790s or something like that. But I'm not sure about the oldest I in the archive. Very cool, thanks. Yeah, so um, in, in your process, you said that you use. Uh, object recognition to extract stuff and then you put lorries on top of it. Have you uh, thought anything about using the format recognizer? Uh, no, that's not uh, not something I've looked into. So I just used the out of the box uh, optical character recognition. Yeah. To yeah, it's just a, uh, a newer service that's intended for uh, looking for at forms. receipts and yeah. forms yeah. and stuff. And most of these are in the pretty same structure, so maybe yeah. they could give you a better accuracy. Yeah, I uh, I, I've looked at the, <laughs> the forms recognized, yeah. but not had time to do it. Uh, we have uh, another project going. This this is just about uh, persons, but there are a lot of uh, books about uh, buildings, for example, and in the text about the persons, uh, buildings are mentioned, so uh, if we could uh, upload the buildings as well. We could link those. Uh, we could geotag the different places uh, and add those to a map, for example. There are lots of books about uh, ships, and uh, lots of people were fishermen or sailors, for example. You could link that. Uh, so there are many different possibilities, and that's what we're looking into uh, for a new uh, project that's underway. But I have limited time on my uh, on my spare time and uh, so if anyone is interested in, in building you can contact me I'm available at most social media or my email address uh, the, the person that collected these uh, books in the beginning he's still involved yeah he's still involved uh, he's all about scanning uh, so he buys up books uh, there is a nonprofit organization that receives do donations. We have a sponsorship from Microsoft for uh, that we uh, has gotten uh, uh, one year ago uh, for actually uh, hosting the services in Azure and try out new things. So I'm looking into uh, to actually use the Azure Face Recognition API and see if there is a difference. And it has evolved a lot since I first looked at it. And now we also have the funding to, to actually try to use it. No more questions? No? So thank you, Peter. Thank you.